are in the heart of the mill, right by our water wheel. Without this, none of this would be possible. The power from the river turns the water wheel, which converts it into our powertrain, which turns all the pulleys and gears needed to operate all the machinery in the building. This place changed so many times with the times to adapt to what was needed. It started out as a wool factory back in the late 1700s where they made wool, but once it was starting to get imported from Europe, that business failed. Then it turned into a grist mill because there were so many farms here that needed their crops converted. So they took corn, wheat from the fields, turned it into flour. After that, they also made talcum powder. We were one of the first accounts of Colgate to make talcum powder, also made graphite for pencils, which was very much needed. Wasn't very popular in town because they made a lot of black dust that covered the town over. So, but it was very neat, much needed to process everything. And then later on, the same wheel generated electricity for the first time and powered the town of Clinton for four hours a day for a few pennies. So without this, none of it would be possible. You have a question? So when it floods, does the wheel go really fast? Mother Nature is really hard to control, but they did an amazing job at it. There's a series of valves put in throughout the whole mill that control the flow of the water, which would control the speed of the wheel. It was extremely important at that time so that if it did rain hard or there was a storm, the wheel wouldn't go too fast so it wouldn't burn any of the products they were making. What I'm leaning on now here is called the husk frame. The sole purpose of these amazing sets of wood was to hold the 2,000 pound granite grinding stone up on the next floor. All the gears that were needed to process that wheel and turn it were extremely heavy. So without these special beams put in and support, it would just fall right through the floor. Even though the majority of the mechanical equipment here was run from the powertrain, which was created by the water wheel, there were still other things that needed to be run without it. And there were so many different components. So a lot of times they incorporated a simple old fashioned treadmill, which they designed. And our little pal here, which is our mascot called Sparky, was one of the animals that they would use if they didn't have enough manpower. So inside, dogs were very popular to put on here. And as they turned the treadmill, it would turn some more of the pulleys that were needed to power and move things from different floors. Outside, they used bigger versions and they used horses outside. But it was very creative, and even for back at that time. Do you have a question? Why is all of it stone and then there's a little spot of brick? That's a great question. Over the course of the years, when the first floor of this building was made in the 1700s, all they had were old stones and mortar from the, that was made from the limestone. But as years progressed and they made something like bricks, they would use them because they lasted longer and they were more supportive. So when holes appeared, they would just use what was the best material available, which at that time were bricks. All right, as I showed you before about the power train, which was so important, there's one of the bottom trains of the pulleys. You'll see by the time we get to the fourth floor how massive these were and how much water power it took to make this turn all the way up to the fourth floor. And as we move up the mill to the second floor, you'll see the grindstones. And then when we get to the fourth floor, you're gonna see the top half of that pulley. It's gonna be pretty amazing. So here we are on the second floor where a majority of the work took place that involved grinding and processing the corn. And what I'm standing in front of now is the most important piece, the granite grindstone. This is the one I was talking about before. It weighs 2,000 pounds and was intricate in processing it so it could get to the next level. This wheel was very, very delicate. Even though it weighed 2,000 pounds, it had to be hand carved and it had to be turned at right to precise speed so that the corn underneath it wouldn't burn. In fact, if it turned too fast, uh, they actually had somebody here whose their job was to lie down on the floor next to it to smell it. If they smelled a smell like burning toast, they would jump up, ring the bell, and start to turn the wheels down to slow the wheel so the product wouldn't burn because that could cost them their job, it would cost product, nobody would be happy, and the most dangerous thing, it could cause a fire. 
There were actually six other mills on, on this river that all burned down because they weren't careful about fire hazard. Also, because of the fire hazards, they had to have buckets down. So if you notice through here, the buckets are all hanging from the ceiling with round bottoms. And that's because they didn't want them on the ground because there was so much activity and so many people walking around, it would have been very easy to trip and knock over a bucket of sand or water, and it wouldn't be available when the fire happened. Again, there were three or four different machines that caused a process of, of utilizing the, the corn into different stages, from the shucking machines being processed to the intermediate steps, which would bring it over to the grindstone, which would grind it into the finest material so it could be put in the elevators and sent up to the fourth floor to the bolt machine that we talked about. You have a question, sir? How did they get the grindstones up here? That's a really good question. That's also a very, very difficult job. Since they were so heavy, they needed numerous pulleys, they needed a lot of men, and they took it up in different stages through the trap doors. So they would wrap ropes around it and hoist it up very slowly. But it took probably about a dozen men to lift this and pull it up. So that was one of the nice pulley systems that were run also by the water. So it helped bring it up. So it was very, very hard. And they needed to replace them a few times a year because by grinding, the more grinding they did, the patterns wore out and they had to be replaced. As we've already seen, most of the jobs here were very difficult, very demanding, very dangerous. But there was still a workforce there that needed jobs. And also another need to make as much money as possible. So they came up with the idea of making baskets. Since there were so many farms here for peaches, apples, and other fruit, nothing to carry them in. So a period of time, people sat here and made baskets out of the wood that came available. This behind me is a fruit sorter which sorted out the different fruit, broke off the branches, and made it easier to put into the baskets. So that when farmers came and dropped off their corn and wheat to be processed, they also were able to buy baskets from us to take home to harvest their fruit. It was a great idea for the time. So now we're ready to go up to the fourth floor to check out where all the final processes happen. It's gonna be amazing. Can't wait to see it, let's go. All right, come on everybody, we made it to the fourth floor. That was a long way up, wasn't it? Yep. Even with all those stairs. Now one of the funny things that people don't realize is back when the mill opened, there weren't any stairs. They had to use trap doors, which I'm standing on one right now, that has been reinforced to get up each level. So they would have to put a ladder from the bottom section up to the middle section and so forth to get up here. All the time while they were carrying tools, equipment, and possibly even sacks of wheat or whatever they were working on at the time. So let's move over here. I'm gonna show you the hopper and how all the finished products got brought down to the bottom floors. All right, well, we made it here just about to the end. What you're looking at now is what we call the hopper. It's the largest part and where all of our finished product winds up. So depending on what was being made, whether it was grist, talc, graphite, it all wound up here to get sent down through the chutes so it could be bagged and packaged in barrels and sent out. Up here on the fourth floor, this is where it all finishes. So when we started getting the corn and wheat in from the farmers on the bottom floor, by the time it made it up here, went through the final refining machines and bolt machines, it all came down this tube and was put in. This is also one of the most dangerous spots in the mill because by putting the product in at a fast pace. A lot of times, even with these support beams, it would clog up. So people would have to go in, stand on the beams with big long sticks and poke it through, similar to a kitchen funnel. You know, if you pour too much flour in the funnel at once, it stops and sometimes you gotta shake it for it to go through. Same thing had to happen here. But you're standing on beams and you have about a 20 foot drop down. So it was extremely dangerous and you had to be very, very careful while you were performing that act. So as everything comes down here and fills the hopper, it all comes out from the final machine, which is called the bolt machine, which has some incredible history. I can't wait to share it for you. Let's come and look at it. All right, everybody, we're here in front of the most important and biggest piece of equipment in the mill, the bolt machine. And it's one of our most famous pieces of equipment. And the reason is it's responsible for the shape of our building. When the bolt machine was brought in in pieces, 
and put together the top piece they realized didn't fit. So they had to break open the roof so they could make sure the pulleys fit. And that became our monitor and one of our most important features of the outside of the building. But the machine itself is a fine machine. It's a refinery machine with a lot of intricate parts, including cloth inside that would bounce the material that it was making, whether it was grist, talc, graphite. The other important thing is it could only do one at a time. So one thing could be run and that is it. So if we're running talcum powder, that's all that could be put into the machine. And then it would have to be taken completely apart, cleaned out before another process could go. You have a question? How does the material move from machine to machine? Well, that's a good question. As you see behind me, there are a series of what simply called screws, turning devices that are powered by the pulleys, which you saw from downstairs. And that puts it through and moves it very, very slowly into the next phase of the machine, all the way to the chutes and into the hopper. Remember when we started on the ground floor and I showed you the bottom half of the pulley? Well, we finally made it upstairs to the top half. You could see what I was talking about, how large this is and how much power was needed from the water wheel and the powertrain to get up here and turn that so we could operate the bolt machine to finish off our products. So we're going to go down now to the wheelhouse so you can take a beautiful look at the wheel from that view over the water and see exactly how it all came together. Okay, everybody, come on into the wheelhouse room. It's funny that they call it the wheelhouse room because it doesn't really house the wheel, but it does give you the best view out the window. What it does house, though, is the change in technology that the mill did. In the early 1900s, as technology advanced, so did the mill. So they invented this turbine, which actually is more efficient and powerful than a water wheel. It works just like the water wheel, except instead of being vertical, it's horizontal in the water. And it also harnesses power more efficiently to put it to better use. So this is where everything came through. So also, because the turbine generated some heat and warmed the water, it attracted a lot of fish and turtles, which made it very easy to catch instead of wading out on the river. So the people got much needed enjoyment and a break and were able to drop nets and gather fish to have some fun along with their hard working day. Somebody's got a question. What happens if something gets stuck in the weed? That's actually a good question. That happened quite frequently. Being a flowing river, pieces of trees broke off all the time. The way this was set up, it made it a lot easier and safer for people to climb down through the hole and remove the debris directly from the turbine so that it wouldn't get stuck. So you've seen an awful lot here. And the reason you've seen this is literally because of five people that we call the Red Mill Five. Back when the mill finished operations in the late 50s and was going into ruin, those five people the, whose families lived in this area their whole lives for generations remembered the mill and remembered how honored and proud they were to have the mill support the town, employ the town, help rebuild the town after the fire, and they did not want it to go to waste. So they banded together and they bought the property so it wouldn't be destroyed. Through a lot of hard work and a lot of time, they finally got it preserved under the Preservation Historic Act, and we opened as a, as a museum in the late 60s and as the, uh, the Red Mill Village in 1975, so we're here today to preserve it for your families and their families and generations to come.